In case you're new, I'm Mary, the bus is Max, the dog is Cowboy, we go places and we do things. That's about as specific as I can get. Last week I brought you a look at the Hocus Pocus witches who kill and eat children but do it in a funny way with musical numbers. This week I thought we needed a palate cleanser of like actual history. So today we're going to look at the real Salem witch trials. I'm not going to dive as deep into this one as I did with Nantucket because for one thing it's a little more well known so you might already know the broad strokes especially if you read the Crucible or saw the movie. Um, and also because I don't have time to edit five episodes. After the little history lesson, we're gonna take a little drive to um, a really special place that I can't wait to show you. No, it's not downtown, because God knows I'd never find a parking space in this mess. So yeah, the broad strokes. In January of 1692, two girls, aged nine and 11, started to exhibit this bizarre behavior. They were having seizures, they were flailing around, they were barking like dogs, and they were saying that spirits were pinching them. Within a short amount of time, a bunch of other girls joined in and started having the same symptoms. A doctor was called in and he couldn't find anything physically wrong with them, so he suggested, as you typically do, that since there was nothing physically wrong with them, they must be bewitched. And I'm not talking about like the wiggle your nose TV sitcom kind of bewitched, but like clinically possessed, okay, if there's such a thing. Within a couple of days, they named three women who they said had bewitched them, and those women were arrested and jailed as witches. That was only the beginning. By the time they were done, 150 to 200 people had been accused and arrested as witches. 19 of those were executed, 18 by hanging. One, Giles Corey, refused to enter a plea. And the rule was you couldn't try someone who refused to enter a plea. So he was basically crushed to death. They put him under a board, they put stones on top of the board, and they said, how do you plead? All he said was more weight. They put some more weight on, they asked him again. The idea being that if they put enough weight on you, you're eventually going to make a plea because you're gonna want them to stop. Joss Corey never caved, never made a plea, just kept saying more weight until he was finally crushed to death. This craziness has been blamed on a lot of things from bad grain to PTSD, and the bad grain thing has been pretty much debunked, but PTSD has some validity, although I would say it doesn't generally manifest in this way. There's this thing in psychology called a folie a deux, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong because I don't speak French, but it's basically a shared delusion between two people, and I think it's possible to have a shared delusion between a larger group of people. There's some science to back this up, Although it's not quite specific to witchcraft, it's about another kind of evil, office teams. This study, which uh, I'm gonna call the bad apple study, I don't know if that's what it's really called, but what they determined in this study is that you can inject a bad apple into a group that's perfectly nice, and that person, that one person, can turn the entire batch of apples bad. Contrary to what Donny Osmond said in his um, 1970s or 60s or whenever it was hit, yeah. One bad apple do spoil the whole bunch, girl. So they didn't reproduce this in the other direction. Putting a positive person in there, it's not like it has no effect, but it doesn't have the same effect as negativity. Negativity seems to be a little more contagious. It's not that surprising to me then that this group of girls could be, you know, together, share this negative picture of all the people around them, this witchcraft thing. Although they also could have just been faking. I think personally it's a little bit of both, and I think you have to look at what life was like for girls in colonial Salem. They didn't really have anything in their lives that you would maybe call fun. The concept of childhood didn't really exist back then, so boys were basically in training to be men, and girls were in training to be women. But for boys, at least that training involved some adventure, some outdoor stuff, like hunting, even chopping wood. They were outdoors. It was physical exercise. The girls, they were training to be women by staying inside, doing home ec projects like sewing and cooking, and taking care of their younger siblings. But another thing that they did was they read, okay? And every household had a Bible in it. There were these other books that were religious books that were written ostensibly as sort of cautionary tales, you know, what you're not supposed to do and all the ways that the devil can get to you. But 
there was something salacious about them too so a lot of people read them to kind of get a glimpse of that dark side you know they were puritans they weren't living it so they were going to look at it okay so there was this one particular book by cotton mather where he chronicled the lives of a family called the goodwins in boston and the goodwin children suddenly out of the blue began to act strangely you know, they had seizures, they were flailing around, they barked like dogs. Sound familiar? All of these things that these girls were doing were in this book by Cotton Mather. Now, what's the likelihood these girls read this book? I'd say it was pretty likely because they also were dabbling with some little, what I'd call occult light, some little games that were detailed in the book as well. Um, Kind of like if you or I were playing with a Ouija board when we were kids, you know, um, like it might just be fun and games to us, but there's people out there who would think that we're opening a portal to the devil. Okay, so they were doing some kind of games that were opening that portal to the devil and they got caught. And when they got caught, they did the logical thing and they pointed at somebody else. The person that they pointed at was a slave named Tichuba. So they pointed at her and said, she made us do this. She's a witch. Well, Tichuba, when she got called in, she, she readily admitted, probably because she'd been around these people long enough to know that they were pretty much nuts and they were going to hound her and even kill her. So she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a witch. I am. And so she named three other people. Once that happened, it snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And all of a sudden, you've got 150 to 200 people accused of witchcraft. Now, the thing that scares me about the story is it was neighbor against neighbor. Just, you're a witch. Boom. You're in jail. Now, these girls who barely have a voice, they have no say in their own families, suddenly there's a spotlight on them and everybody's paying attention. They're being viewed as people who have a certain type of authority. And they know from watching the world around them that they're not going to get that even when they grow up to be grown ass women. You know, women there don't have any authority. So they're soaking this up. And the way that they can keep this authority is by keeping this going. Okay, so there's got to be more and more accusations. Some of them probably start to believe that it's happening. Some of them are clear that it's not. And sometimes every now and then, even during the trials, one of them would step up and go, you know, we're faking, right? And then they would slide back in line, you know, pressured by the other girls or because they genuinely believed it. I don't know, but they would slide back into the story eventually. Initially, it's the sort of outliers, you know, the fringe dwellers, the people that either nobody likes or that do the behavior that's questionable because you remember they're Puritans, right? So people that drink or fight or women particularly that drink or fight or have children out of wedlock, they're targeted initially. But after a while, that's when it kind of starts to look like these girls are being manipulated. So it's kind of like that 1-800-GOT-JUNK commercial that's on right now where they say, you got stuff you want to get rid of? All you have to do is point and poof, it's gone. So you've got these girls and they're like a loaded weapon. You know, if you can influence them correctly and you can, you've got somebody who's in your way, they disagree with you politically, they're standing in the way of a land grab, whatever, you can say, that's a witch, poof, gone. These girls could point, poof, gone. So. That's a lot of power for these girls to take in. And because they're children, basically, they're easily able to be manipulated. More and more people are starting to go, I don't know about this thing, but they're not saying so out loud because saying so out loud is a recipe for getting called a witch, you know? Until it hits the wife of the governor. The wife of the governor gets accused of witchcraft and that's pretty much what brought the whole thing to an end. The governor put the court proceedings on hold at that point. And in January of 1693, a year after all this started, the people they haven't got around to executing are released from jail. Of course, they're not found innocent, so their families have to pay for their boarding costs the entire time they were in jail. Yeah, but they get out. What happens to the accusers? Well, basically nothing. So that's the broad strokes, that's the story. Now I gotta get on the road because I've got something I wanna show you. There is no peace tonight. I'm trapped in my mind. And I don't know why there's no peace inside. So why of all the important things in Salem am I showing you this Walgreens? 
Why am I parked at this Walgreens? Behind this store might be the most important site of this whole story. There's a place in Salem called Gallows Hill. There's a park there. Historian and politician Charles Wentworth Upham suggested it as the spot of the executions in one of his books. And the assumption for a long time was that that's where the accused were hanged. But that didn't jive with the accounts from the day because people talked about being able to see the hangings from their windows, which would have been impossible, the site that Upham named. Also, the cart that took the accused to their death could never have made it up the steep hill there. A historian named Sidney Purley, who was also a lawyer, did a lot of research, dug into everything, and he had another theory. And that theory put the hanging spot right behind this Walgreens. But it wasn't until recently that they were able to scientifically prove that this is the spot where the accused were hanged. So the city has made a memorial here. It's still a very small, modest spot on a really tiny street. Oh, how you try so hard to find what peace I have left inside. But I know oh, oh, that I find a way to keep fighting. for sunglasses <laughs> but as soon as I walked up here into this crescent I just got so emotional you know so I feel a little better with the sunglasses on I don't know why why it gets this kind of reaction from me it's not like I'm related to these people or know these people or you know it's not like it's the worst tragedy that's ever happened 19 people died about 25 if you count the ones who died in jail. There's a lot of situations where a lot more people died. You know, there's genocides, there's wars, but there's just something about your whole community just turning on you like that, you know? Just, and also just that Hello. nobody knew this was here, Hi. you know? Looking for a grave site of Salem Witch Tribe. I wish I could get less shy about having the camera running when people are there, but because I turned it right off as soon as that guy approached, but I turned it back on. What I missed was he tells me that he's from Russia and that he's come here from Albuquerque. Okay, from Russia by way of Albuquerque, and now here he is at Salem. So, of course, I'm interested because why not? Wouldn't you be? I turned the camera back on. I didn't tell until I turned it back on. Not yet, but I will. Okay, moving on. Really? What made you come all this way from Albuquerque? I'm not speaking English. Why did you come? No good. Why did you come all the way from Albuquerque? I want to see the yeah? story. See yeah. the story of, of Salem. Yeah. I'm here for two weeks. It's quite a story. Where is... Proctor, that's my favorite. Proctor um, is right here, John Proctor. This is the man, Moore Stone. Uh, I think you might be thinking of Giles Corey. So here's where I start to get a little like, eh, I don't know about this whole situation, because here's this guy who cares enough about the Salem witch trials to have come from Albuquerque but originally from Russia, to see the story in person. But he thinks John Proctor is the one who said more, more weight, more stones. So that, I don't know, I just think if you're that obsessed with the Salem Witch Trials, you're probably gonna know that that's Giles Corey. Giles Corey is so often heralded as this like, man of such deep integrity because he did the stones thing. And you know, I'm not here to cut anybody down, but these are just regular people, okay? I mean, Giles Corey had been on trial for beating almost to death one of his slaves not too long before all this happened. And in fact, Giles Corey initially believed and even supported the charges against his own wife, Martha Corey. Probably he was refusing to 
enter a plea because if he didn't enter a plea, they couldn't take his land away from his sons who were standing to inherit and he probably knew he was going to die one way or the other, whatever plea he entered. These people were complicated people and that's part of how they ended up in this situation. You know, if they were rivals of somebody in power or somebody in power didn't like them, they got accused of witchcraft. Now, John Proctor, on the other hand, who my little Russian friend was confusing Giles Corey with, they were neighbors, and uh, there was a lot of bad blood between them. In fact, there were lawsuits between them, between Corey and Proctor. So, yeah, John Proctor and Giles Corey, two very different people. John Proctor is probably burned into the memory of most Americans, at least, as resembling Daniel Day-Lewis, who played him in the movie The Crucible. But, you know, I have no evidence that that's true, because Daniel Day-Lewis is awfully handsome. What is, what is this? <laughs> I was just, when you came, I just was recording something. Oh, I'm so about. sorry. That's okay. I'm so sorry. Now I'm recording mean, you. <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt. I'm, no, that's I'm okay. I'm sorry. Now I'm recording you if that's okay. Um, no, probably not, okay. but we'll drink to that. Yeah, well, you can drink to that. I'm just going to. A lot of people don't like me because I'm from Russia. They don't like you because you're from Russia? Yeah, I'm from Russia. Maybe they just don't like you. Maybe it has nothing to do with being from Russia. You don't like me either. <laughs> I like you fine. You know, it's funny that you read about this in Russia as a little kid. So many people in this country don't even know this story. Totally fucking with you right now. Oh! All right, I live here. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Okay, did you catch that? He's not Russian. He's American and he lives up the street. October's great. Everyone loves October, yeah. September. But come like May or June, like this fucking Wendy's bags around here. Yeah. And there's trash and, and, and it's filthy. Every day every day I go to work, every day I come back and I see trash inside this and I pick yeah. it up every day. Right. I throw it right there. Right. Every day I pick it up. Right. Now all these people are coming around and they're like, oh my, this is the time. So this is when I asked him if I could interview him on camera and he agreed. I would not call what comes next an interview, though. Maybe a little more of a rant. Okay, so... How do I look, man? You look great. Stand on this side so we can see the memorial, though. Are you sure? Yeah. You look great. Well, I will say this. You look this, great on my iPhone 11, This though. is a monument to be respected. These people were innocently murdered for something that they had no part of. So, it's to be respected. If you want to have fun, you want to go out in Salem and go crazy for Halloween, it's downtown. But down here, this isn't a place of celebration. Right. It's a place of understanding that these, these names were all murdered by a government that thought they were witches. Now think about that for a minute. If I say you're a witch, Mary, all of a sudden you're executed? That's horrible. There's no government in that. So, if we decide to celebrate that Everybody's and not follow the rules of not going up there, because they weren't hung up there. That's not the spot they were hung, by the way. Just saying. I know the exact dirt. That the, the trees are still there. It's not there. They come the police. But uh, it's all fun and games are in October. But when I walk up, up and down the street every day, because I live here during uh, May, June, July, there's Wendy bags. There's trash, and every time I pick it up and I put it in these dumpsters, there's bottles of pure tea, ice. It's disrespectful. This is a gravesite. So at this point, I'm a little confused because he's like haranguing these tourists about how in the non-tourist season, there's trash all over the place. Like, the tourist season for Salem, I mean, May and June, you know, it's not really the tourist season. And if that's when there's Wendy's wrappers and iced tea bottles and stuff, then wouldn't that be more likely to be like the locals, not the tourists at all? That's it, have fun, enjoy Salem, but don't disrespect the dead. That's mm -hmm. all you have to say, man. So why do you think people wanna go in the woods? What do you they think? think so? They think that the hanging tree's right up there like it's the Hunger Games. No, I know where the hanging tree is, it's still alive today, but I will not tell you which tree it is. They use one tree. One yeah. tree only. And that tree is still alive today, but I will not tell you what tree that is. I know which tree it is. How do you know? Because I did my research mm -hmm. and uh, I read up and I, I know people. Mm -hmm. People in Salem that know the truth. Mm -hmm. Respect the area. Mm -hmm. You don't have someone, you know, sitting on your grandmother's grave drinking beers. 
Um, right. If you saw that, you would be disgusted and angry. Right. And there's no one to speak for them. 1612. Yeah. 1692. You were close. That's yeah. all I gotta say. Uh -huh. I want you to speak Russian a little bit to, for me, though. But that was a ruse. I know, but I wanted... <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to explain how I met you. Hey, it fooled you. It totally fooled me. Fooled you. Totally fooled me. Told you I was from Albuquerque. That's in Canada. Okay, I shut off the camera too quick again because right after I told him that Albuquerque's in New Mexico, he said, Oh, I'm thinking of Albany. I think he was actually thinking of Albania. You know, Albania, Russia. And I won't go with you down below.